Hello, welcome everyone to our 2022 monthly webinar series. I'm Anna Popovich with Humanist Canada and I will be moderating today's conversation. Uh, this webinar will be 60 minutes in length with a 15 minute Q&A at the end of the presentation as always. And uh, if you have um, any questions or comments and would like to ask them directly, please raise your hand. Uh, you can find the hand uh, function at the bottom of your screen, or you can also submit your questions uh, with the Q&A tool at the bottom of the screen as well. Um, our topic today is uh, Siwa Mayu, a river of hummingbirds, indigenous languages, and non-alphabetic writing in the Americas. And uh, with us this afternoon is Dr. Juan Sanchez Martinez. Juan dedicates both his creating and scholarly writing to indigenous cultural expressions from Abiyala or the Americas. Uh, his book of poetry, Altamar, was awarded the 2016 National Prize by the University of Antioquia in Colombia. He has authored and co-edited multiple publications, including Cinema, Literature, and Art Against Extractivism in Latin America, the Five Cardinal Points in Contemporary Indigenous Literatures, and the multilingual anthology, Indigenous Messages on Water. Juan also coordinates the online publication, Siwar Mayu, um, A River of Hummingbirds, about which he's going to talk uh, in this presentation. Uh, he grew up in Bogota, Colombia, and is currently an associate professor of languages and literatures and Native American and Indigenous studies at the University of North Carolina, Asheville. Uh, thank you so much, Juan, for accepting thank the you, invitation. Anna. And over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for everyone being here. Uh, thank you for this invitation. I'm really happy to, to talk about, about this project. I have prepared um, a presentation. Siwar um, Maju means a river of hummingbirds in the Quechua language. Uh, I'm speaking today from Bacatá, Bogotá, Colombia from the Andes, uh, this is the place where I am from. Um, uh, uh, and you can see in the back, and this, uh, the Paramo, basically, that's a special ecosystem that, that protects and, and feed the, the city of Bogota. Um, and also you can see in the back two hills that are, that have been there before uh, Bacata, Bogota, and probably will be after. <laughs> um, these mountains today are, are known as Monserrate and Guadalupe, but those are names that were brought by colonization. And the original names are Tensaca, Chihuahua. And so this is the, the original place of the Muisca nation. And, uh, and uh, that memory, you know, that was lost in colonization uh, uh, is, uh, is, is being remembered these days, you know, by mixed race Bogotanos and by the uh, Neo Muisca community. And so, uh, this is part of my history, and I just wanted to share that with you. Um, as Anna mentioned, I live in North Carolina, in the in the mountains, in the Appalachian Mountains, and and uh, which is a region where we always we also find like many native languages and indigenous peoples. Um, uh, the University of North Carolina Asheville is located like 30 minutes from the eastern band of the Cherokee Reservation. And it, it has been a beautiful, a really important time for me, you know, like a, to learn with the community, to some friends, you know, from Cherokee and to, to walk and visit, you know, these mountains, rivers and, sometimes uh, sacred sites and 
Um, but in addition of the Salagi language, which is the, the language of the Cherokee, uh, there are other languages that are being spoken in this area, like the Nyanyu or Otomi, the Kankobal, and the Anishina Maui. And so this is a beautiful event that we organize with some friends. Uh, uh, and I just wanted to share this to you. So because this place that we call the Americas and that, uh, that indigenous peoples, indigenous movements, scholars today call Abdiayala, the land in full maturity uh, is full of native languages and stories that have been erased um, uh, for centuries. And so this is uh, so Siwarmayu is, I uh, just coordinate, I, uh, my work is, is, a, is, a, is a bridge to, you know, like I connect and I sometimes translate, but this work wouldn't be possible with all these beautiful friends and who support this, uh, this project, Siwarmayu. Uh, like Jana, Gloria, Freddy, Sophie, Rita, Andrea, Lori, Maria. E this is some of the pictures I just wanted to, to mention and acknowledge that this is a team. So Siwarmayu, a river of hummingbirds, is a um, trans-hemispheric, intergenerational, and multimodal. So I'm gonna propose to you, I'm gonna show why, you know, in this brief presentation, and I'm gonna show some examples. Uh, we are interested to connect, you know, the South with the North through translation. And uh, we are interested in uh, trans-Indigenous dialogues. Um, we believe that uh, this is not just about the letter, the alphabet, but uh, many modes and codes and channels that indigenous peoples have used for, for millennia, you know. So Siwarmayu, uh, Siwar uh, in Quechua is a hummingbird, but there are many words in Quechua for hummingbird, like a uh, kindi is another one, or kinti, depending where you are in different places in, in the Andes. Uh, I have to say at this point that I don't speak uh, uh, any native language. Uh, I am just, I have been trying to learn, you know, many. <laughs> and as you may know, you know, this is a lifelong commitment. And, and so uh, I'm still in that process, like, um, uh, but what is important of this image of this word for our project is that the kindi uh, is known as a go-between, you know, um, a messenger uh, in the, the Quechua tradition, in the Tawantinsuyu, you know, in the pre-contact time. Uh, there used to be a figure uh, respected in the in the uh, among the the Inca. Uh, a civilization that was called the Chasqui, and it was this person who was running, you know, between different points of the Tawantinsuyu, uh, bringing messages uh, in Kipus. And we know this for um, cronies like uh, Felipe Guaman Poma de Ayala. And so uh, that image is, 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 is an inspiration, you know, um, for for our vision of the hummingbird. Um, he's also a bridge, a chaka, uh, he said in, in Quechua, uh, uh, in between worlds. And so we like this idea. This is one of the guest artists in our project. If you visit the website, perhaps while I am uh, speaking, if you wanna go to the site, Siwarmayu, and if you wanna check, you are gonna find that we have the artists and we have writers from different nations and uh, sometimes using uh, their native languages and sometimes using their non-alphabetic writings. So today I'm gonna talk about three places 
briefly uh, the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma and uh, the Eastern Band of Cherokee in Western Carolina, uh, the Kachikel community peoples in Guatemala and the Chipibo Conibo in the Peruvian Amazon. So non-alphabetic writings, what, what that means, uh, why I'm, you know, like inviting uh, you to, to think about this. Um, I'm thinking about uh, the way how um, uh, literacy and the way how our understanding of literacy and our understanding of writing, you know, has a silent other ways, other, other expressions, other ways of writing that uh, were not, um, were found less, you know, by the ideas that the conquistadors and the, during the colonial period, people had about education, about civilization. Um, and so there is a, Chonon Bencho is one of the artists that is part of Siwarmayu, and she is um, she works in, in in embroidery, but also she paints. She 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 just won the national prize in Peru of art, and so we were really happy that happened recently, like the, the, the last week, and so um, she her work is is so beautiful, not just, you know, aesthetically, but there is so much within these images, this embroidery, you know, these symmetries, these details. And when we start uh, uh, researching about the Chipibo Conibo uh, embroidery art, we learn that Kine designs symbolize the identity of the Chipibo people. There are different kinds of Kene. When the designs have been embroidered on cloth, they are called Kewe. So what we just saw is a, a part of the Kewe technique. Um, and symmetry is achieved in this work through a kind of harmonious tension between complementary op opposites between man and woman, between the lake and the highland in which human beings live, between the horizontal movement of the fish and the vertical growth of the trees, between the sun and the moon. And so uh, I just I, I just would like to, to that you imagine an uh, embroidery that someone is able to read as a song. So those type of possibilities exist still today in the Amazon among people like the Chipibo Conibo. And Chonon Bencho has received this knowledge, you know, from her elders. And she was raised, you know, a, with the specific plants and specific, as she has said in her interviews and in, in the text that she offered for Suwarmayu with her husband, Pedro Favaro. And so, so beautiful, you know, the way how she explains, you know, her art and the, the, the way how um, uh, uh, the Chipibo Conibo relate with the with the plants, you know, the plants are constantly present in this conversation about art. Um, I remember that there is there is one plant, for example, that uh, the that is used that, um, to prepare this specific medicine, and some of a little bit of this uh, medicine is used as drops uh, in the eyes of the of the artists that are working this type of work. And so um, this kene is also reminds me uh, like a, it, it pictures the world as a textile itself, you know? 
So it's almost that the air is part of also of this uh, web, you know. Uh, if you research further and you will see that in the dresses, traditional dresses of the men and women, you are going to find this type of kinet too. So this is a, you know, and, and there is writing, you know, and that's, that's, the, that's the main uh, message that I would like to leave here. But I'm going to show you another example for now. Walter Paz Hoch uh, is Kachikel uh, from Guatemala, and he's a, a designer. Uh, and this is the type of work that he does. And so what he's trying to do uh, is something uh, really special is that he's using, reclaiming, you know, the, the pre-Columbian um, glyphs as we call it today, and the pre-Columbian Maya writing, you know. And so this is a Walter Paz words. A, my work is based on an inspiration on and inspired by the form of ancient Maya writing Sip. It seeks to represent in my own way and my own style, ideas, feelings, and emotions as a Maya Kachikel. I always I ask the artists in Suwarmayu, hey, tell if if they have time, you know, like tell me in your own words what is what is your art? You know, like how how do you see art? Like how do you feel it? And so you will find those types of comments in Siwarmayu. Um, when he talks about seed, uh, this is a, a really important word these days in indigenous studies from Abyayala. Um, and this is a, a, some bibliography, you know, that perhaps you can check if you are interested about this topic. On writing Maya literature was published in 2019 by Paul Worley and Rita Palacios. Enrique Palas is a professor in Canada, and they are researching about SIP among indigenous literatures and uh, Maya performers and artists. And, but of course, you know, this work has been uh, done by many people for decades. And one of them is Gaspar Pedro Gonzalez. He, he is a can cancobal uh, poet and writer. He wrote the first novel in Maya, in a Maya language in 1992. It's, I think that the title in English is A, a Maya Life. Um, and uh, so Gaspar is, uh, he was, he also published in 1997, this book called Kotsip. And today, you know, there are other spellings. And basically it, it's a word that is an alternative to understanding writing that does not stand in opposition to alphabetic writing, but rather fully encompasses it and adds a lot of things inside. So zip can be the glyph, zip can be the writing in a textile, you know, the, the, the designs in a textile, zip can be a the novel of Gaspar Pedro Gonzalez and the indigenous poetry, contemporary indigenous poetry. Um, so it simply is a more like, I would say inclusive way to understand writing that is beyond alphabet. And so um, this type of work is generating a lot of um, avenues, you know, to, to, uh, to rethink literacy, you know? And so that's something that we are thinking about in Siwarmayu. So in this beautiful image, you know, you find at the top, for example, a, um, a, a lot of a glyphs that you will find in pre-Columbian codex. You know, in a codex like the Dresden Codex or the Madrid Codex, you will find these same glyphs and they are sometimes together in this band. And so people who research about these uh, ancient books, 
they call this specific band the sky band. And so those, those some of these um, symbols are a, a referring to the sky. And so, hmm. so when you start going deeper into this image, you, you start you know, making connections. Uh, so is this mother you know, connecting, connected with the sky and connected with the earth? And what mother, what grandmother is she? You know, and so it's beautiful. And the 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 what I really uh, appreciate and enjoy and uh, seeing in in Walter Passhock's art is how the Jews in Guatemala uh, is uh, embracing, you know, this um, this knowledge that their ancestors uh, built and had. And because, you know, like uh, uh, the history of our nations, you know, and the, the history of colonization, um, uh, it's beautiful to see how art is, is powerful in that way to, to, you know, to question all those narratives, racist narratives of the past. Um, the third artist that I would like to talk about today, and, and the last one before I, I move to our, um, some ideas and conclusions and thoughts, is Joseph Earp. He is a, from the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma, and a, this a video, this short, short animated film, The Beginning They Told, it was the first Cherokee animation in Salagi, the Cherokee language. So all the, the, the characters are speaking in the, in the Salagi and Joseph have worked with elders, you know, to put together and community in general, to put together these videos, you know, some of these elders are the, themselves storytellers. And in this first video, we don't see the, the Cherokee syllabary, but in the in the movies that he started doing after, you know, he started including the syllabary itself, and so I, I will talk a little bit about the syllabary because it's another, you know, a, a writing that is not alphabetic, and but it's inspired, so it's, it has an interesting story. So I just wanted to say about the beginning they told is. Is, 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 the, is the creation story uh, according to the Cherokee um, a version at least. And in this version of the story, uh, at the beginning is everything is water and all the animals are hanging on this, uh, what's the word? Is uh, they are, they are, a, like in a gourd, you know, they are all living there. And this gourd is, is suspended from the sky a, through with these four cords with the four colors. So it's, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful image, you know, of the beginning. And in this story, the beaver and the grandpa beaver and the water beetle and the great buzzer are protagonists. And so it's beautiful uh, how, you know, Joseph Earp uh, finds a way to represent this uh, sacred story that is still being uh, told and that is still being guiding, you know, like, foundational principles of the Cherokee. Um, so the Cherokee syllabary, it was invented by Sequoia in the 1810s. And by 1825, most of the community could read and, and write in the new code. And so this is really important in the history of indigenous peoples and colonization. And, you know, because the Cherokee, um, as many communities, you know, in the in in Abjajala, they they found their ways to adapt and to take what they 
what they found useful in order to coexist, you know, with the settler. And so, and until today, you know, they, they are really proud of this history because they were the first nation to create a newspaper fully in the syllabary and salagi, you know, like the salagi being a, a greeting as syllabary. So that's something that is unique about, about this region. And, and if you think about it, you know, this is just few years before the, the Trail of Tears, as it's known in, in the, the United States history, when a lot of the nations in the, in the Southeast were forced, they were, you know, displaced to, to the West and, you know, in an action um, where the government, you know, didn't respect the treaties and the, and the, that, you know, existed before and in the middle of the winter. And it was, uh, it's, um, it's a really sad moment in the history of Abya Yala. And that's why, you know, if you are not familiar with this history, you know, the Cherokee Nation is in Oklahoma and the communities who, who stay in their orig original lands are around the Eastern band of the Cherokee and other communities that are not part of the reservation, like the 2T community. And so all this is, is so important today, you know, and because again, youth and artists are reclaiming all this history and uh, the syllabary is in the, in the iPhone, you know, and it's in these films and it's in art. Right now, there is a beautiful exhibition in the Museum of, of Asheville, North Carolina, uh, of like more than 50 Cherokee artists that are um, using the syllabary in their art. And one of them is Joseph Er. So it is not just the use of Salagi and the syllabary uh, that makes this short animated movie Cherokee, but also the way the elder ones talk respectfully with each other and are comfortable with their long silences. So there's a different aesthetic in, this, in these movies, you know. Furthermore, small pieces of a complex cosmology are shared in these stories, such as their relevance of the numbers four and seven, or references to specific places where the community gathers medicine. So uh, Joseph, for example, before he makes, he represents these stories, he, he needs to ask to do it in the proper way, sometimes have, you know, like conversations with the community, with the elders to make sure that everything that is said is okay to share. So this is a, the, sorry, I'm gonna, just close a window. <laughs> so, and this is a John Henry Gloin. He's um, a Cherokee artist, um, a Cherokee tattoo artist, and also a painter. Um, this is one of those uh, artists too that is a um, feature right now in the Museum of Asheville. And he's also part of Siwarmayu, um, a Cherokee friend, Dr. Trey Atcock interviewed uh, John Henry. And it's a beautiful, you know, conversation about, you know, how did, how he ended doing tattoo, you know? And, but also, so he has all these uh, beautiful references in his art to um, Cherokee stories. And for example, if you, if you see in the, in the left, the left a image of the spider, you know, that spider, water spider is also really important in the creation story and how a, the Cherokee got the, the fire. And it was this little being, you know, like the little beings are so important <laughs> uh, and who, who found a way to go a closer to the to the first tree where the fire was being kept 
by you know these people, perhaps giants. And so she went and she she weaved this beautiful basket. You know the Cherokee are uh, have this beautiful traditional basket ba basketry, and a they they work with the with the river cane you know and different trees of the area you know Appalachia is is so rich so diverse in, in plants and medicines and and trees and so this is the knowledge of 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 the community you know and it's still here and so it's so beautiful how you know it, we love in Siwarmayu how it, we are breaking these stereotypes about indigeneity as something of the past or uh, as uh, indigeneity something different than, you know, like this divisive dichotomy between tradition and cosmopolitanism, for example, you know. And so, so this is what uh, this art is, is teaching us, you know, and so it, Below the, the spider is greeting in the syllabary uh, Anikituwagi, which is one of the names of the Cherokee, because one of the stories tells that Cherokee is a bad pronunciation of something else that the first settlers heard, you know, when they went to for first time to, to this area. And actually, the first visitors, the first settlers, were Spanish people, and so uh, that's something also really important from the southeast of of Turtle Island or the north of Abiyala, you know. So, so they have their own, most communities, you know, have their own names, their own ways to call themselves, and so in this case, Anikituwagi. Um, as I have been told, is per, perhaps coming from a word that is ani gadui, which means a they who are from this soil, from this dirt. And so, kituwa is also a, a mound that is in the within the the eastern band of Turkey that is uh, where the fire is kept. So all these references are, are, are present in these in these paintings and art. So when I think about indigenous languages and non-alphabetic writings, I always think about these two words, worlds, you know, and uh, because um, it's not just about the language; it's about how language is cross by a epistemologies, by ways to relate with the land and ways to relate, to relate with our bodies. So I would like that you think about it, you know, like how this body, language and the land are intertwined in this conversation. Every time you speak an indigenous language, you resist. To speak an indigenous language in the present circumstances is to inhabit a cognitive territory that has not yet been conquered, at least not all of it. So this is just Naya Elena Aguilar, a um, um, uh, linguist and writer who I really admire and She's reminding us, you know, like how important it is to is that is that action, you know. And so, even if I don't speak a, fluently any of these languages, and despite I have tried, and you know, I I I I am conscious that while I, while I say them, you know, something is happening. And sometimes uh, some of the conversations that we have in indigenous studies and in this in, with friends, you know, from communities, it can can only be said through native languages. And so that's when you start seeing, you know, like how the 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 power 
the weight, you know, the value. And yeah, so they can even help us to remember who we are. <laughs> and so Indigenous Cosmolectics, this, this book by Gloria Elizabeth Chacon, who is also um, part of the team of Siwar Maji, is, is definitely recommended. And, and th there is this, uh, uh, all this conversation, you know, about language, non-alphabetic writing is, is also discussed. So writers and artists who have shared their production with Siwarma, you preserve and celebrate a close relationship with their territories and places of water. Their works are metaphor, image and song for remembering our ties to the earth model. Um, in Siwarma, you, we believe that, you know, art and music and animation and literature it's not just a, you know, like a, a, a in something to, 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 to learn, you know, it's not just information, it's not just something to analyze or entertainment, you know, to be entertained. It's all that, but it's much more that, than that, you know, it happens that it's really politic, even without saying. And it's also a, it touches, you know, like a questions a, a of our times, you know. You know, we are in this crossroads between um, environment and a, a race and gender. And all these works are, you know, like, working through this and, and, and bringing, you know, these teachings that come from afar and providing us beautiful answers. So this is um, Rodrigo Diaz, uh, a Maya Kachikel photographer and videographer, and uh, he's also a part of Siwar Maya, this beautiful picture. <laughs> So through this collaborative river of hummingbirds, we fulfill a need for an open access website publication dedicated to native writers, artists, languages from the seven directions of their mother, in which peoples from different countries and backgrounds can dialogue through art, poetry, short stories, plays, testimony, oral history, essays, etc. Of course, this is this is happening. Uh, also in, in many other publications and anthologies. And I just wanted to mention some that you may find interesting, you know, if you are new in these topics, like Sing, Poetry from the Indigenous Americas by Alison Hedgecock, um, the Poetry Foundation, you know, they have a beautiful um, anthology online, but it's just in English, you know. And, but it's, it's, it's really good. And that was prepared by Alison Hedgecock. And we also have anthologies in Spanish, you know, also. And, but so what we are doing is that we are making it, you know, accessible. And, and so we are proud because a lot of people are visiting, you know, and, and from all over. And, uh, you know, people in the communities, people in universities, people so, so, please feel free to share and we are doing this for that. <laughs> so, um, so that's all what I have for today. Thank you so much. And uh, feel free to, to ask and, and share whatever you, you want. Thank you so much. Thank you, Juan. Uh, this is such an interesting project. Uh, diverse and broad in scope. And I saw that you also have paintings and poetry. So I really enjoyed looking at it. Maybe you can uh, drop the link to the website in the chat in case people want to yeah, check it out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, and so we have a couple of questions. And please raise your hand if you would like to um, ask your question or make a comment directly. Uh, wonderful presentation. Can we say that in the past, men have often spoken but not communicated well? However, women have used the weaving to communicate. 
uh, over many years. So can I don't understand well the, the question. Tim, would you like to ask the question and then you have a follow-up question about owning land? Uh, would you like to ask the question yourself? I've, I've read a lot recently about the uh, power of women uh, using weaving and other forms of visual communication as language and uh, whereas men spended, spent a lot of their time talking and trying to gain power from each other or, or ownership or whatever, all the time that's what they concentrated on, but the women were recording real feelings and what was going on. Their history was often recorded. Even you go back to 1066 in Britain, the, uh, the Battle of uh, Hastings, as it's called, where the Normans came in, it's represented in a tapestry, which is about... I don't know how many hundred feet long, uh, which represents that battle. And it was done by women. It was done often by nuns, not always by nuns, but people who were, were communicating that way. And when we tried to look back at history then, it was very little of it was really written. And that was done in a, in a form of handwriting that was very difficult for other people to read. So uh, this communication through pictures is, was very important. And I, I think women have done this uh, a better better job at history in the past than men have. We 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 often dismiss this as uh, as not any importance. But you're showing in your work how important line um, language in visual communication and tapestries was done. I don't know how many men were involved in this. I think you've shown some artists that were men, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I believe many of the many much of the work in certainly in Western civilization on tapestries was done by women. So I was just um, mm -hmm. making a point about that. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Yeah, that's really interesting. Like, <clears throat> I don't think that the like because the 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 amount of communities you know and different nations and traditions that that we uh, invite in Siwarmayu uh, is is really hard to generalize like in a specific um, like a, a work within the community uh, I mean to assign a, for example weaving to a specific gender can be is is not a is, is is difficult to do it because it's so diverse you know perhaps in some communities yes perhaps in other communities no and we also have the the beautiful conversation today about a a third or four genders you know like the non-binary identities and so it's fascinating i know that you know, like uh, if I think we will have to to talk about an, uh, one specific community, and um, I am thinking right now about the Waju community. So if you go to the to the I'm gonna write here. If you go to Siwarmaju, you will find that there are several uh, posts about the Waju nation. So the Waju Nation is the biggest um, nation, a indigenous nation in Colombia and Venezuela. So they are in the coast, in the Caribbean, a, in the north of Colombia and in the north a, west of a, Venezuela. And so, a, and they are people of the desert and they are great weavers and, you know, and they, they create these beautiful mochilas, you know, bags and they have them. But so in, in, in the community, you know, men, as I know, they, they know how to weave their stuff, you know, and women know how to do their stuff. And is so both weave, but they, they are in charge of the specific objects that are useful for themselves. So some things like that are common in many communities. Uh, uh, so, but it's definitely, uh, I, I really appreciate your comment about the, how history and memory is kept, you know, with these non-alphabetic writings. And I am, I'm always fascinated about, if you are familiar with the Kipu, 
you know, the, the writing with knots in the Andes, those knots of colors and that are still being used in some communities in the Andes. You know, that's a semi-geographic uh, uh, code. It's, it's, it's an interesting word, semi-geographic. And semi-geographic means that you don't need to um, speak the same language to be able to read it. It's like numbers. Because, you know, if you know the code uh, of, the, of, the, of the notes, you know, this is a writing that is based on notes in a, in a chord, you know, in a, and so uh, if you know what do they mean, what they mean, uh, you can read them in any language. And this was so useful for the Tawantin Suyu because the Tawantin Suyu is today, you know, basically South America. You know, it was so big that probably there were many, many, many nations, many languages and variations of the Quechua. And so that writing was useful for the, for the, for the empire, if you want to call it like that, we call it Tawantin Suyu. And so, uh, yeah, so it depends, you know, like writings, uh, there are not layers, sometimes can be more useful and lasting which is, is contradicts, you know, some of the ideas that we have heard before in Western education. Uh, thank you. The follow-up question is, in modern Western society, land is owned and not so much man maintained and understood, you know, as opposed to indigenous communities. So, I mean, this is such a huge question, also great question. So maybe you can say a few words about that. Um, and I guess it's not just land, but also nature, right? The unique relationship to nature that indigenous community communities have uh, across such a huge landmass. And and maybe if if I can show a, an image from your website, the yes, sa please. Sacred mushrooms. Uh, but in the meantime, oh, yeah. you can you can speak to that, and I'll just share my screen. Yeah. So about land and a, so wow it says is yeah it's some it's, um, it's um mm, it's a beautiful conversation because mm, I guess when we think about you know ownership in in our societies today we have to think about the legal the social contract and this a social contract that comes from um, a legal legal rationality that was invented in Europe, and so a, a that a crosses all our constitutions and ways of you know moving around. However, a, so it depends on the country. Indigenous peoples have different like relationships with the nation state you know like in the united states and canada for example indigenous peoples talk about treaties and in those treaties eh, so there are specific responsibilities sometimes canada or the us don't have not respect those treaties and um eh, um, some of those treaties in the case of Canada were with the crown, you know. And so in the case of Colombia and or Ecuador, for example, there are other types of relationships and, and a, um, indigenous peoples are part of the constitution, for example, uh, but they have a specific chapters dedicated to them. And in those chapters, land is a name and understood in different ways. So it, it all depends where we are talking about. Now, if, if we are talking about the indigenous ways of being, definitely a, what you mentioned, Tim, is really important, is that a, beyond ownership, there is a relationship with the mother. And so that's why indigenous peoples in their... A, 
a lot of philosophers, leaders, writers, scholars, they always talk about relationality as a key principle to understand kinship, not just among humans, but among a humans and between humans and non-humans and beings, you know? So uh, that means that, you know, everybody who is in the land has to be respected. So it's not just, I'm going to buy this land and I'm going to do whatever. I'm going to cut all the trees. No, because those trees traditionally are standing people, you know? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Feel free to raise the hand or put them in the Q&A. Unfortunately, I cannot share my screen. I just upgraded my system and it's blocking me. I have to sort this out, but I put a link in the yeah. chat to the beautiful painting uh, with sacred mushrooms um, and the uh, I think that I uh, right. It's yeah. It's 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 one of those. Um, uh -huh. Right. Yeah. And for example, the importance right of <laughs> the mushroom culture, right, or um, hallucinogenic experience in, for mm. example, in these communities from southern Mexico, right, in the area of Oaxaca, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, these come from. Uh, so maybe you can say a couple of words about that. Uh, is this like a different experience, aesthetic experience? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's reflected uh, in these very unique images, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. Is So René Alvarado Martinez, uh, he's a Mazatec artist. And if uh, maybe you are familiar with the work of, um, uh, of Maria Sabina, uh, you will remember that, you know, they, the Mazatec uh, still keep the knowledge of uh, the mushrooms as medicine. And so, um, that is a, um, yeah, so the, the vocabulary, as you notice, you know, the vocabulary that we use to talk about these things is really important and is constantly changing, trying to find the best ways, you know. If, for example, before, you know, people used to say hallucinogenics, uh, but uh, these days, for example, people use words like entheogens which is something like the, 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 the plants that make to the God, the plants to make the God within to be born, something like that. Um, and so there are many indigenous peoples all over Abhyayala, new, identify, you know, receive this knowledge, practice, you know, experience and understood you know, what you can do with them and brought from those visions and therapeutic experiences, beautiful designs. And so, for example, the kene that we saw from the from Chonon Bencho and these images also from René Alvarado, eh, eh, you know, are related with those experiences. And sometimes uh, some of the artists that we have invited to Suwarmayu, they work with these plants uh, themselves or they, their families are part of this, you know, like uh, lineage of medicine people. And so, so they speak from, from that place. And uh, sometimes they use specific uh, plants in their paintings like pigments that come from the same plants that they're representing. Sometimes they use a specific brushes with a specific materials. Sometimes they use uh, crystals, stones. So all those elements that we, we don't have time to talk in depth, 
uh, are really important for them. You know, so materials are really important for indigenous artists. And so, and uh, yeah, I, I, I would just say just to finish that um, the mushrooms actually are a, a call a little children by the Mazatec and they are a, a such a beautiful medicine a, to heal yeah the body and the spirit mm -hmm. mm, thank you and maybe we just have a couple of minutes left maybe we can show one last image and i'll uh, drop it here oops what, what is in it? the this i'll one? i'll no i'll put it in the chat okay um if you can please open that and uh, i was uh asking you about this uh, in our conversation before the webinar right that so in, in latin america we know that art has always been closely related to politics and they always go hand in hand and so this is reflected in your project as well for example in the work of the peruvian artist chijiko right yes. which is a series of images uh by this famous um, artist uh, that are denunciation of the mining industry and i know that you've written about that as well Yes. So can you say a few words about, about yes. that? If in, And also I'm curious, person, like if this has been effective, you know, yes. in mm -hmm. sort of in the political processes, because I know that this is a huge um, mm, struggle, right? It's, it's yes. a, in, in a lot of countries, including Bolivia, Peru, and Mexico, right? among others. Yes. Yes, so that, that conversation tied, like is related with the, with the conversation about the land, you know, and the way how, you know, like colonization, capitalism, extractivism has threatened the land. And so Chijiko um, a, is a fantastic, a, how do you say, caricaturist, a, a, who through humor and, you know, a exaggeration, you know, he critiques the bad decisions uh, of the Peruvian politicians who have been complicit in many, uh, like, uh, in, in violence against indigenous peoples uh, because of the, the mining interests, specifically oil uh, in these last years, you know. But also he criticized he criticized many things like tourism, you know, for example. And so he's he's based in Cusco, which is um, as you know, you know, like a really touristic place. So his art is is being like is is present in Cusco, you know. He the he has a magazine, you know, with a group of friends. They are publishing constantly things and and it was fantastic that he accepted to be part of Subarmayu. Mm -hmm. So definitely uh, recommended Chijiko. This is an this is an ex president, for example, <laughs> of Peru, and you know, like the Lama is is, is a little bit upset with him. <laughs> um, all right. So um, thank you so much, Juan, for this very engaging presentation uh, and uh, i would just like as always to uh, close with a couple of announcements if you have a moment to share your thoughts about this webinar or would like to suggest a speaker or a topic uh, please fill out our post webinar survey you will find the link in zoom's follow-up email and in the in the same email you will also see a link uh, to sign up for our monthly webinar announcements if you would like to receive email uh, notifications just about the webinars uh, and finally our next webinar will take place in a month on sunday march 27th as always at 3 p.m eastern and sarah cooper from the university of manitoba will join us to discuss the past, present, and future of low-cost housing in Canada. Uh, and this is a webinar by um, a request from uh, one of our members. Uh, so happy to uh, bring that to your attention. And you can find more information about the webinar on our website and social media platforms as well. Uh, so once again, Juan, thank you so much for your you, presentation. Anna. 
and thank you all for joining and have a lovely rest of your day.